And I now give the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Sri Lanka. Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the floor. Sri Lanka aligns itself with the statement made by the non-aligned movement. Mr. Chairman, universal jurisdiction is a jurisdiction, as we all know, based solely on the nature of the crime. It must therefore be appreciated that national courts have a role to play and can exercise universal jurisdiction to prosecute and punish and thereby deter heinous acts recognized as serious crimes under international law. When national courts exercise universal jurisdiction appropriately, Mr. Chairman, in accordance with internationally recognized standards of due process, they act to vindicate not merely their own interests and values, but the basic interests and values common to the international community. Universal jurisdiction holds out, as we know, the promise of greater justice. I say the promise of greater justice. But the jurisprudence of universal jurisdiction, unfortunately, is disparate, disjointed, and poorly understood. So long as that is so, this weapon against impunity is potentially beset by incoherence, confusion, and at times even uneven justice. Mr. Chairman, international crimes, which we sometimes are called co-crimes, are crimes such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, aggression, naked aggression, I say, as we presently witness. We now see the crime of torture being added to that list, uh, and we have also seen controversial matters uh, such as terrorism, uh, two crimes against the environment, and corruption being similarly uh, endeavored to be classified. It must, however, be appreciated that criminalization of these offenses is not merely about which of these specific acts warrant the status of international crimes. We must realize that it also involves what, what treating them as international crimes would entail. What are the defining features? What is it that warrants the special treatment of these offenses? What is the international component that we need to have? Is it some sort of transnational crime? We need to therefore distinguish, I say, these features and appreciate the distinction. International criminal tribunals also have a vital role to play in combating impunity, undoubtedly, as a complement to national courts. In the wake of mass atrocities of oppressive rules, national judicial systems have often been unable or perhaps sometimes unwilling to prosecute serious crimes under international law. This is ostensibly why international criminal tribunals have been established. Treaties entered in the aftermath of World War II have strengthened international institutions and have given greater clarity, I say, and force to international criminal law. A signal achievement of this historic process, of course, is the creation of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Now, enhancing the proper exercise of universal jurisdiction by national courts, I say, will help close the gap in law enforcement that has favored perpetrators of serious crimes under international law. So therefore, crafting clearer and sounder principles to guide the exercise of universal jurisdiction by national courts should help to punish and thereby to deter and prevent the commission of these heinous crimes. Nevertheless, the aim of sound principles cannot be simply to facilitate the speediest exercise of criminal jurisdiction always and everywhere, and irrespective of the circumstances. We must be guarded, however, against the improper exercise of criminal jurisdiction, including universal jurisdiction, as it may be used, I say, merely to harass political opponents or for aims extraneous to criminal justice, as in politics and the misuse of law. What is needed are principles to guide, as well as to give greater coherence and legitimacy to the exercise of universal jurisdiction. These principles, I say, should promote greater accountability for perpetrators of serious crimes under international law in ways consistent with a prudent concern for the abuse of power and a reasonable solicitude for the quest for peace. Mr. Chairman, we must stand firm on the footing that to stop this cycle of violence and to promote justice, impunity for the commission of serious crimes must yield to accountability. International law, uh, uh, the, I must uh, make it a point to remind ourselves that what will be irrespective of the roles of national courts and international tribunals is another aspect 
we need to give our mind to. International law describes an international crime as an act that international law deems universally criminal, and I think the International Law Commission to give serious thought to this aspect of the matter in, in deeper detail. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished permanent representative of Sri Lanka for his statement.